you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation. In my talk today, I'm going to describe what I hope to be, or what I expect to be, a um, uh, the foundations of a complete reformulation of all of quantum field theory, at least perturbative quantum field theory. And so I'm going to try to be as general as possible and clarify whenever it's necessary, which, uh, you know, the results that are applicable in all theories and, um, and those which are particularly nice in special theories like n equals 4 or planar n equals 4. Um, but one thing that I really want to emphasize is this connection between Grassmannian geometry and scattering amplitudes in a general quantum field theory. And that's actually, I mean, one of the main themes of this talk is to uh, highlight the, how this interplay can teach us about physics, and it also can teach us a lot about some very interesting questions in pure mathematics. Most of this talk, uh, you can find more details in this pa long paper um, uh, from last year, and I might as well pitch it that uh, it'll soon be available in, uh, as a book from Cambridge University Press. So an outline is basically, I'm going to start with kind of a microcosm, a parable, that illustrates many of the, uh, uh, the, the spirit of this research over the last decade, and um, really is a great illustration of both the uh, problems that we face with the traditional formulation of quantum field theory and the kinds of uh, simplicities that we can that we hope to uh, capture with this new formulation. Um, then I'm going to introduce these, this broad class of objects that I want to motivate mostly in their own right, totally in, independent of amplitudes, which is called on-shell functions. And it's the connection between on-shell functions and Grassmannian geometry that's very clear. Whether or not scattering amplitudes can be expressed in this way in a general theory is still somewhat of an open question, but it's becoming increasingly clear that it's probably uh, possible. Um, we'll derive the all-loop recursion relations for planar n equals 4, um, but it's more or less just as an uh, excuse to, to look at some examples um, in detail. And we'll discover that, in fact, the reason why planar n equals 4 is such a nice theory is because it's entirely combinatorial. So, and I'll, we'll close with that. Okay, so imagine computing the yes matrix for two gluons to create, create 4. This happens millions of times a second at the Large Hadron Collider and is uh, important for a lot of... Um, I mean, it's an important background that you need to compute. Many of you will probably be surprised to learn that, that by the 1980s, no such amplitude had ever been computed. And it's easy to see why. Um, as soon as you start thinking about it a little bit, you realize this is totally intractable on pen and paper um, and with all, I mean, with Feynman diagrams. Basically because there are 220 Feynman diagrams that contribute to this process. Thousands of terms, okay? And from, so from the point of view before computer calculations uh, became really tenable, this was a completely intractable problem. And it was actually an important enough problem that when they, when, uh, uh, in the 1980s, when they were considering the prospects of a, of a superconducting supercollider, um, one of the papers outlining the problems that they faced, and, you know, the, the kinds of things they would need to deal with, highlighted the fact that uh, the cross-section for such processes had never been calculated, a no cross-section for such a complicated process had ever been computed, and it's um, and it might not be evaluated in the foreseeable future. <clears throat> now, there's few um, ways to motivate somebody better than telling them that it's impossible. And so Park and Taylor quickly jumped on this and tried to tackle this particular amplitude. And then in the particularly simple, ca simple case, when the two gluons and the four produced are all the exact same helicity. OK, so they took up the challenge, and they used every trick they, they could use. They, they introduced an auxiliary supersymmetry just to simplify their work. They put this on, on the world's most, one of the world's most powerful supercomputers at the time, interestingly enough, called the heterotic supercomputer at Fermilab. Okay, and they, as soon as they got it all done, they rushed it to publication. And I just love this thing, so, so this paper. Um, it's not their most famous paper from the 1985, but they, um, so as soon as they got the result, they rushed it to publication, and basically the entire paper is the answer. So they define some coefficients, and these coefficients are these big matrices, and of course you don't need to read any of this. It's just some rational function. It's the sum of 220 Feynman diagrams. But the reason why I love this paper is because of the completely um, unexplainable optimism with which they chose to end it. So after apologizing for not giving any of the results, they say, furthermore, we hope to obtain a simple analytic form of the answer, making our result not only an experimentalist's, but also a theorist's delight. And I have no idea what they saw in those eight page those eight pages that made them think they could simplify it. But six months later, they stumbled upon a guess that must have exceeded their wildest dreams. So, and I'll, um, 
I'll explain the notation in a second here. But in modern notation, the formula they guessed is the following. You have two gluons coming in, four coming out, all the same helicity. That's the answer. Okay? Now, and by the way, this answer was checked numerically. They evaluated on that supercomputer and saw that it was the same. Okay. Now, any 10-year-old um, uh, can look at this formula and say, well, if this is true for 2 goes to 4, it's got to be true for 2 goes to any number whatsoever. And so it naturally suggests a single-term formula for the scattering amplitude for 2 to produce any number of particles whatsoever, as long as all of them are the same helicity. Okay, this was their guess. It took a long time to prove it. We'll prove it in this talk. But this is a truly, truly remarkable degree of simplification and really an indictment against the standard formulation. After all, when two gluons produce 50 gluons, the number of Feynman diagrams involved exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around. And if this result is correct, all of those you know, 10 to the 88 Feynman diagrams collapse into a single formula. What's wrong with the traditional formulation? And that's what I hope to really kind of capture in, the next, in, in this talk a way to, re to rethink scattering amplitudes that makes results like this completely manifest. So let me explain this notation. Um, there, isn't mu there aren't many formulas in this talk, but, but the ones that, the few that I write all involve this notation, and it's useful to, to uh, at least review it for those who aren't familiar with it already. Um, this notation goes back, to its, um, this amplitude is written in terms of spinner velocity variables, which are due to Van der Veerden in 1927. So they go back quite a long ways. The idea is very simple. So, um, you, instead of writing a four vector for each of the external momenta, you can write it, you can dot them into the poly matrices and get two by two Hermitian matrices for real momenta. Okay, and, it's, and you can notice that the norm squared of the, uh, of the momentum is just the determinant of this two by two matrix. So instead of writing four vectors with the constraint that they are on shell, you can instead make it manifest that for a massless particle, this, you can just write any determinant that a two by two matrix with vanishing determinant. And there's a very easy way of making a two by two matrix with vanishing determinant, which is to write it as the outer product of two two vectors. So you write it as lambda, lambda, tilde. Um, and if you notice there's a one extra degree of freedom there, and that's because this identification was left invariant. If we rescale lambda by anything and lambda tilde by the inverse. Okay. And the lambdas are associated with the angle brackets and the lambda tildes are with the square brackets. Okay. Now, the um, now momentum conservation here is just this basically a statement that the sum of the momenta is zero. I've taken all the momenta to be incoming here. And this dot notation, and I'm going to use this a lot in the talk, so this dot just means summing over the n particles. Okay? Now, local Lorentz transformations act on lambda and lambda tilde separately as SL2 left and SL2 right transformations. And that means that the only invariants that you can write, the Lorentz invariants, have to be constructed out of the determinants of these things. Um, so this angle bracket thing, like 1, 2, just means determinant of these two two vectors. Um, and, um, yeah. and of course, you can rewrite all of your favorite Lorentz invariants in these mis mis notation. This is basically content free. It's just notation here. So this uh, rescaling of lambda by something and lambda tilde by the inverse is the, represents the action of the little group. And it's worth noting here, because it's going to be useful in a moment, that um, the way that a wave function for a particle of some particular velocity transforms with uniform weight depending on the helicity. So under a little group transformation, the wave function has to rescale in that way. Um, and that will prove, and that also means that any function of the wave function needs to rescale like that too. Okay, so the kinematical data of which this is a function is a pair of two by n matrices. A, a two by n matrix of the lambdas and a two by n matrix of the lambda tildes. And I can write this in a bunch of ways um, in terms of that. This is just the product of all the consecutive two by two determinants of this two by n matrix. So all the consecutive minors of this matrix. Now I can think of this um, horizontally as, as a collection of n two vectors, which is the way we naturally would think of it. Or we can think of it as a pair of n dimensional uh, vectors. And the one reason for thinking about it that way as a pair of n dimensional vectors is because the Lorentz transformations rotate them into each other. And because of little group rescaling, I can also rescale them globally. And so this is the Lorentz invariant content of this two by n matrix is really just these two dimensional, these two n vectors, two vectors in n dimensions, modulo rotating them into each other and modulo rescaling. So in another way, it's the span of, of, these, two, of these two vectors in n dimensions 
And the span of k vectors in any number of dimensions is a, a first example of a space that I hope you'll become very familiar with called the Grassmannian of k planes in n dimensions. You can always think of this concretely as a k by n matrix modulo GLK. Okay, now momentum conservation, and this is worth mentioning in detail here because it's going to prove so important in just a couple slides, um, is it becomes this geometric statement here that lambda dot lambda tilde really means that lambda is in the orthogonal complement of lambda tilde. So if for any, any k plane in n dimensions, there's a natural dual plane, which is an n minus k plane, which is just the space not spanned by that n plane. That's what I mean by this perp here. So I don't actually mean orthogonal, there's no metrics here or anything. I just mean the complement of the span. Okay, but we can think about this in, in, in coordinates, if you'd like, as just being, saying that the lambdas and lambda tildes are orthogonal, are both planes going through the origin, and the two planes have to be orthogonal in n dimensions. And this will prove very restrictive um, in, uh, for the case of three particles, which I'll get to in a moment. Okay, so this is the setup. This is the basic language. Now, there are a lot of ways of kind of motivating the story I'm about to tell, but the, I think the, the best way of understanding where the simplicity is, or why, instead of explaining why this is so simple, it's, easy, it's much easier to explain why Feynman diagrams are so bad, why they fail to capture this simplicity so horribly. And it's because in every one of those you know, uh, 220 Feynman diagrams, in order to write those down as, as functions, you need to introduce gauge redundancies, you're talk, they're all functions of virtual particles, all of these things that are physically, experimentally unobservable. And so Feynman diagrams, the, the basic framework that we talk about physics, requires the introduction of an enormous amount of theoretical, arbitrary parameters that the, that the experimentalist couldn't care less about. I mean, gauge redundancies don't ever affect observables. And so that's the most likely culprit. And so one way to perhaps motivate the story I'm about to tell is to think about the class of, I, of functions that we can discuss meaningfully without ever introducing any such redundancy. Said another way, to what extent can, that can the results of quantum field theory be reproduced without any mention of any unobservable quantities? No virtual particles, no ghosts, no Lagrangians, no gauge redundancies. You know, well, how far can we get if we exclude from our very language those kinds of concepts? And you'll see in a moment that apparently we can reproduce everything. So if we're going to exclude from our discussion anything that's uh, any unobservable quantities, we're limited, it seems like we're fairly limited to a small class of objects, for example. One thing that we can talk about is the full S matrix for n particles. Of course, that's uh, something that only involves observable quantities. But if we knew any S matrices whatsoever, it's very easy to start constructing more. For one thing, for example, if we had two of them, we could glue them together in a meaningful way dictated by quantum mechanics. Now, this is not a Feynman diagram. This is a factorization channel, which would say, in other words, the residue of the Feynman diagram on this pole. But, let's, but instead of thinking about it in Feynman diagrams at all, it's just meaningfully well defined by quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics dictates the meaning of this function in the following way. For every internal particle, so first, because the internal particle is on shell, it's a physical particle, if it's massless, these two amplitudes can be separated by arbitrary distances in space and time. And so they're very distant, obviously, this, the, you have to multiply the two amplitudes together. And now, and unitarity dictates that we have to marginalize over unobserved states. And so we need to sum over all the possible states that could be exchanged between them. And that means integrating over their on-shell phase space and, um, and summing over all the possible states, the helicities, masses, colors, etc. Okay? So that is the meaning of that picture. And that story follows through in a theory with massive particles, just as easily as it does with massless, it doesn't make any difference. That's true, and you know, this is just a basic statement of quantum mechanics. Now this story here, this rule for dealing with internal particles, usually falls under the category of generalized unitarity, but I want to emphasize that this is really basic quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, importantly, this example may seem a little trivial, but we can, this immediately generalizes to an arbitrary graph of, of amplitudes. So if you draw any graph with amplitudes at every vertex, the same rules of locality and unitarity dictate what we mean by that as a function. And, we're, we, and it's defined without any reference to virtual stuff or you know, unobservable things. And the rule's the same. It's the product of all the amplitudes and integrating over all the internal stuff that's not observed and summing over all the states that's not observed. Okay? Now, there are a lot of some general characteristics. And I want to emphasize, again, this is true in all quantum field theories. Any number of dimensions doesn't make any difference. So but one important 
there's a, there are a few important characteristics of these diagrams, and one of the most obvious important ones is how many constraints, you know, how many constraints are being imposed on the external kinematical data. So because every amplitude carries a momentum conserver conserving delta functions, the number of delta functions involved in this expression is four for each vertex, and then we have three integrations for each internal line. So we have, uh, so this is how many delta functions there are in this expression, and of course if you have a graph of momentum conserving amplitudes, Total momentum conservation is always implied. And so it's natural to actually think about the number of excess delta functions, which is 4 times the number of vertices minus 3 times the number of internal lines minus 4. So the number of excess delta functions. So we calculate n hat for this thing, and we see that it's, that it's 1, because there's a 2 times 4 minus 3. Okay, so we have 5 delta functions left over, 4 of which impose total momentum conservation. So now that means that it's minus. If we had a graph that had a, a negative net, net number of deltas, that would mean that there were further phase space integrals that we had to do to define this object. And that's very useful because it turns out that, that such excess integrations exactly correspond to Feynman integrations for loop amplitudes. That's a story I'll get to in a moment here. Okay, so this graph, of course, has one net constraint imposed on the external data. It's obvious because it says that, that the sum of the left momenta is on shell. Okay, that's a, obviously a constraint. But if we had a graph where n hat delta is zero, that would mean it was just an ordinary, and it happens to be rational, function of the external kinematical data. Okay? When it's negative, it means that there are that, uh, minus that number of extra, extra integrations to do. And when it's positive, it means that there imposes some number of constraints on the kinematics. Okay, so we've already seen an example of a graph. This, this factorization channel imposes one constraint, a net constraint. But let me show you the first example of a graph that imposes no excess constraints besides just the single amplitude. This thing. Now, historically, this has been called a one-loop leading singularity in a very confusing uh, historical language that I want to get away from here. This, when you look at this graph, you know that there are four, so there's four times four delta functions, 16 delta functions, 12 integrations, so there's exactly four delta functions left over, it's exactly the four momentum conservation. So this picture means a rational function of the external data. Always, in all quantum field theories, at least in four dimensions here. So this, so this picture is well defined, and it's just a rational function. It has nothing to do with loops. It has, don't, don't think about it as a, as a, it has nothing to do with loops in the, in the normal sense. This is a rational thing. In fact, it's much more tree-like than it is loop-like, so it's just a rational function. Okay. Okay, now some of you might be thinking at this point, all right, well, this is all well and good, but um, how are we going to lift ourselves from our bootstraps if we don't have any amplitudes to talk about? Um, I mean, after all, uh, we don't know any, we don't have anything to feed into this machinery yet. Well, it turns out there's um, that for these theories with massless particles, um, the three particle S matrix is uniquely fixed by momentum conservation and uh, Lorentz invariance to all orders of perturbation theory. So it doesn't get renormalized or anything like that. And that means that we can just write it down once and for all. And so a graph built out of three particle vertices is well defined to all loop orders always. So, Let's, let me tell you that story. Because it's a little, uh, just to convince you of this fact, let's talk about the completely general case. So in four dimensions, at least, we have three massless particles with arbitrary helicities. Okay, so we think of it as some function of the lambdas and lambda tildes, and momentum cons conservation, of course. Now, recall that momentum conservation said that these two two planes, you know, this, this, this two by n matrix, these are orthogonal in three dimensions. Now, of course, a, there's, it's impossible to have a pair of orthogonal two planes in three dimensions. If you have a two plane through the origin in three dimensions, there's a unique vector pointing, you know, it's orthogonal complements of one plane. And so momentum conservation dictates, and this happens to be what it is in terms of brackets, doesn't matter what it is. The point is, is that is that momentum conserve if you have a general two by n matrix of lambdas, then it's orthogonal complements of one plane, it's a one vector. And that means that lambda tilde has to be spanned by this or the parity conjugate. So, I, so you can't have a pair of generic two planes. Either one of them has to be a one, either lambda tilde has to be completely fixed by lambda or vice versa. And that means that really we can't, the three particle amplitude can't be a general function like this. It has to be entirely, exclusively a function of the lambdas or exclusively a function of the lambda tildes. This is an important point because it's impossible to construct any little group neutral combination out of just the angle brackets or out of just the square brackets. And that means that the functional form is completely dictated by the little group scaling property. 
right? So the, the weight under the little group rescaling. And this is the right answer. It's very easy to, it's, a, it's like a two-line exercise to put arbitrary coefficients and fix all the coefficients by the scaling, okay? So for any helicities, this is the unique answer for it's either this or it's that. Those are the two cases. Now, it actually bifurcates because um, we can, uh, for real momenta, lambda and lambda tilde have to be up to a sign or complex conjugates each, of, each, of each other. And so for real momenta, it's impossible to have one of them be a two-plane. They both they have to be or complex conjugates of each other. So the only way to, to so this is only true for the analytic continuation for complexified momenta. When we, and the limit of real momenta is basically making all the brackets vanish. And so, and when you have all the brackets vanishing, this thing scales like epsilon to the minus the sum of velocities, and this one scales like epsilon to the positive sum of velocities. And the, requiring that the, the S matrix for three particles smoothly vanishes, doesn't go, it doesn't have a pole as the, as the momenta that could become real, dictates that if the sum of velocities is negative, it's this answer, and if the sum of velocities is positive, it's this answer. If it's equal to zero, it can be a combination of the two. Okay, so, so, so we have two distinct cases depending on the velocity. Okay, now we can just start, we can talk about these concretely for different theories. So let's say we're talking about pure gangnels. Let's say we have a theory of just gluons with plus or minus one velocity. So then we have a, an amplitude like this and another amplitude like this, plus their rotations. And then you just plug in h equals plus or minus one into this formula, and you get this thing. Okay? And um, if we have a theory with just one kind of particle, we can decorate the graph by, um, we can, instead of writing the velocities on the lines, we can, we can indicate the flow of velocity by drawing arrows. And so these blue vertices mean two in and one out, and the white vertices mean one in and two out. So there's a sink, one, one is a net sink and the other one's a net source. And we don't need to then tell you all the velocities, it's implied by the diagram. But similarly, we can draw these things for any quantum field theory we'd like with massless particles. For example, in QED, although now we have to have two different kinds of lines because we have different kinds of particles, we can use the same kind of notation and use a wiggly line. I'm not going to draw many pictures like this because this is deceptive, confusingly similar to Feynman diagrams. And this has nothing to do with Feynman diagram again. This means that rational function. Okay. Um, now, the reason why n equals 4 why maximally supersymmetric theories are so nice is because the plus and the minus helicity uh, uh, wave functions are in the same supermultiplet. And that means that in n equals 4, instead of having three different helicity amplitudes, depend, you know, three different decorations of this vertex, depending on which one's the outgoing one, there's just a unique three-particle amplitude of each type. So in n equals 4, the reason why it's simple is because there's just exactly one three-particle vertex of this type and of that type which means that I can start gluing them together without telling you all the arrows involved. But if we added arrows, we can, of course, talk about these diagrams in any theory. Okay. But this is why n equals 4 is so simple. And it's going to be the main reason why it's going to be the primary example in this talk here. Okay, so in n equals 4, we just have diagrams with these kinds of vertices glued together in any kind of complicated way. And these define functions that are defined to all orders of perturbation theory because the three particle things out of which they're built are defined to all orders of perturbation theory. So are you saying that the fact that you go to 4 equals also super conformal does not help? Doesn't matter. So that, that is actually a, a precise statement. I mean, it's, what if I just care about, I mean, I understand the, the, you know, the spinner, this is kind of yeah. known, right, since many, many decades. So that's fine. So that, that I understand very clearly. So, but I thought that the fact that the theory is conformal plays a role at least when you care about adding many, many diagrams and not worrying about the randomization group. I mean, because this is just a kinematics, pure kinematics. So it's trivial. Because, because of the three... Dynamic, there's also dynamics inside the one part. So that because... That cannot be completely ignored, right? Well, because the three-particle amplitude... So, so it's the kinematical dependence of the three-particle amplitude is fixed. Because it's fixed by just re, little group rescaling and momentum conservation, um, it's... It, it's Kinematical dependence is, is fixed to all orders of perturbation theory. Of course, there's a coefficient in front of it, which is a coupling constant, and that <coughs> might vary. Okay, so, so your point is that you're just creates, fixing the trigger to kinematics because of the non perturbative dynamics that can be, for example, if I have a conformal field theory, it can compute the correlation function which are dictated honestly and, and just by the conformal group. That actually is in the prefactor. So the interesting part is in the prefactor. You're just taking the. the, uh, the, the Still interesting by kinematical factor. That's right. Yeah, we can decorate them with uh, the. Yeah, it's, it's important because it doesn't mean that's that a very common theory. 
That's a very good point. We have yeah. 25 billion years with different 3-point functions. You're just basically elucidating the kinematical part. That's right. Which can be very complicated, but it's just a pure yeah. kinematic, right? Well, I Dynamic is in every factor. I, I hope to convince you that the kinematical part's a lot less complicated than you might have thought. No, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But, but, but you're right, I'm, not, I'm ignoring... If I'm doing the lattice, I want to go to the big factor, right? The kinematics, so that's just a lot less to compute. Yes, yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, so, so let, let me show some examples of diagrams. So, at n equals 4, we can start, we can glue two of them together, and we get a factorization channel. Of course, this is the residue of the four-particle tree amplitude. Okay. But we can start gluing together more complicated ones, like, for example, this little box, again, has nothing to do with the loop. It's a rational function because of the general statement about the four amplitudes. So this is just a rational function of the four momenta, and it happens to be the tree amplitude in n equals four. It doesn't matter that that's the case. Because we can start gluing together more and more complicated diagrams, whether it's planar, non-planar, doesn't matter. This thing has four extra integrations attached to it. This one has two extra integrations attached to it. Who cares? I want to, I want to emphasize that these diagrams are meaningful um, regardless of where they came from or the relationship to amplitudes or anything in particular like this. It happens to be the case that this picture alone is the full four particle planar loop one loop amplitude. Um, because when you do that, those four extra integrations, you, there's a way to prescribe the contour so it exactly matches the Feynman. Sorry, angle. just to be clear, all the internal lines they have to be on shape. Of course. Otherwise, it's also So just basically connecting yep. one PI. Yep. So, but I can start drawing more and more complicated diagrams and more and more complicated theories. For example, in n equals zero, I can draw a picture like this with four outgoing things. This happens to be, this would be related to the, a rational term or something that involves all outgoing, so all plus gluons on the outside. Uh, this is a, doesn't impose any constraints on the extra data, and it's a one loop integral. So, it's kind of interesting. We can draw these pictures in QED as well. This picture happens to be the, the the, the, the uh, electron photon scattering in QED, the tree amplitude. But again, I'm not going to draw many pictures like this because this is way too similar to what, what uh, I mean, what a Feynman diagram looks like. <coughs> okay, so but again, generally, we can start gluing these things together any way we'd like, and we can construct meaningful th functions of the external data that are independent of any internal gauge redundancies or virtual particles or like that. And when you compute the n hat delta for this diagram, you find that it's zero. So this is just an ordinary rational function, and you can just compute it. And it, that's what it is. That's what it is when you find it. OK. So now what I want to explain is why this story, why if you start thinking about diagrams in a systematic way, you are naturally led to think about the Grassmannian and why, why the Grassmannian is relevant to these kinds of pictures. Whether it's planar or non-planar doesn't matter. Okay. And the reason is because if you start trying to systematically compute what these diagrams mean, you have all these little three-particle delta functions at every vertex. Now, uh, ordinarily, these delta functions are quadratic in the external kinematics, but we, as we've already seen uh, uh, momentum conservation factorizes into two different linear constraints for three particles. Either you're in the white one relevant to the white amplitudes, or you're in the case that's relevant to the blue amplitudes. In the other case, it's a linear constraint, and you only care about one of the two solutions. And so if you want, so the, a systematic way of computing these diagrams would be you'd like to systematically linearize the momentum conservation in every single vertex. So that the whole, so momentum conservation just becomes a bunch of linear equations across the diagram. And there's a very simple way of doing that. That is to introduce an auxiliary, a, you know, uh, an unobservable, just a, uh, some redundancy into the, the way we calculate it, by introducing an auxiliary two plane B, so a little two by three matrix B for every three blue vertex, and then write this, and I'll explain what this notation means in a second. And uh, for every white vertex, introduce a one by three plane, okay, and then write this instead. Now, the right-hand sides might look very scary, but I, 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 I hope you'll believe me that this is, it becomes dramatically easier to solve momentum conservation with, in terms of these representations. So let me, first let me explain what I mean by these things. First, like, what do I mean by six integrations modulo GL2? What I mean by this is, like, pick a gauge. So to, what I mean by this volume form is to pick any, uh, uh, choose any two of the columns to be the identity matrix, and then write that, write the product of all the cyclic minors of this matrix, and you get this, or that, or that. And similarly for the W, this little one, two, three down here means the one by one minor, which is just W1, W2, W3, down there in the denominator. So that's just an instruction to pick a gauge. Now, it's easy to see that the constraints here, so this has introduced two extra constraints and two extra integrations in both cases. 
And in this case, if we use these two constraints to fix B, it tells you that lambda is orthogonal to the orthogonal complement of B, which means that B is lambda. So if we use the, these two delta functions to do this integral, it says that B it fixes B to B star, which is just equal to lambda, and then this expression, you replace B for lambda for B everywhere, you net obviously reproduce this left-hand side. And similarly for this one by three case, um, if we use these two delta functions to solve momentum, you know, to do this integral, we see that W has to be lambda tilde per. The orthogonal, W is orthogonal to lambda tilde, so it's that three vector, and then that immediately reduces to the left-hand side. Okay, so this is, so this is a, somewhat of a triviality, but the important point uh, emerges when you start trying to glue these things together in a big systematic way. So, so let me, so let's, and when you start doing that, what you end up getting is you get all these little, little two by three matrices and these little one by three matrices, and now doing the, the phase space integrals now just eliminates rows of this matrix. Momentum conservation is now entirely linear in terms of some big auxiliary matrix. So let me show you what this, the way this looks. So first, what is, so C is some K by N matrix. Why is it an element of the Grassmannian? It's an element of the Grassmannian because this is just linear equations. And any system of linear equations is invariant under GLK transformations. You can add constraints to each other any way you'd like. And so it's obviously a GLK st invariant statement. And K is just the two by N matrix for every B, every blue vertex. There's a one by N matrix, or three matrix for every white vertex. So the size of the matrix is twice the number of blues plus the number of whites, might, and then you eliminate one row per internal line. So let me show you what this looks like in practice. So if we wanted to glue these things together, as say, we start with a little one by three matrix to the left and a two by three matrix to the right. Now we can construct the outer product, which is just some big three by six matrix there. And now we want to do the space space integral over i and i prime, and eliminating that brings us down to a one by, or sorry, two by four matrix. It always lowers k by one, and we get this thing. So this is an expression. If you replace this with, you put in the volume forms as well, you'd get a nice expression for the uh, factorization channel. Okay. So, but I want to again emphasize this is a general statement. It's not a statement about it, planar planarity or anything like that. And if we replace the numerators for, say, non-supersymmetric theories, we, this statement would also apply. Okay. So let me tell you one technical tool that's very useful in this game, in this story, which is how to build up diagrams in a very systematic way, which is if you start with any graph and you add to it this, this, uh, these two extra vertices, which I'm going to call BCFW bridge, and can thereby construct a new graph, the new graph is related to the old one in a very simple way. So notice that this operation adds eight delta functions, two for each vertex, and it increases the number of phase space integrals by three because there are three new internal lines. So we have eight new delta functions and nine new integrations to do. That means that we have one net extra integration to do. So this adds, thinking about it in the, other, in the gross minds, is this adds one new internal degree of freedom to the picture. So obviously, the, uh, we can see this very concretely here. It doesn't act, this, these equations don't really matter. The point is, is that we introduce one new degree of freedom. To be very concrete about it, we say that we have this onto phase space, we solve momentum conservation, we can identify the new degree of freedom, call it alpha, and when you do this calculation, you see that the new one is related to the old one by just evaluating its shift of momentum with the d alpha over alpha, an integral over d alpha over alpha um, in front of it. So by as soon as long as we have diagrams that are related by bridges, we can construct them concretely as just this little d alpha over alpha on a shifted diagram. Okay, this is the only ingredient that we need to know to derive the all-loop recursion relation. So let me show you that now. So imagine you knew what the, all, the full n particle s matrix was. Or say, I mean, um, uh, well, I'll qualify it in a moment here. But let's say we had the n particle s matrix and we added this, uh, this, we added this BCFW bridge. This introduces a new degree of freedom which we don't actually care about, right? What we care about is the left-hand side, the thing without the alpha in it. And of course, the thing without the alpha in it is the residue around alpha equals zero of the shifted thing, the deformed thing. But we all learned in complex kindergarten that we can trade the residue around the origin for the sum of the residues away from the origin. And so that we can write the left-hand side as a bunch of terms where alpha is not equal to zero, where this bridge is present, but where we had, where we had poles of this object. And the physical input of, this, of the recursion relations is that we know from basic principles of quantum mechanics and from Feynman diagrams, if you wish, what all of those poles have to look like. They're when some internal 
find and propagate or goes on shelf. And those can come in two types. They're either factorization channels, which means that when you cut the Feynman diagram, it breaks the diagram in two. Or there are what I'm going to call forward limits, which is when you cut the, cut the Feynman propagator, you don't get, doesn't break the diagram in half. Instead, you get a lower loop diagram. So it's lower loop object with two extra particles sewn together for this. But now, of course, alpha is not equal to zero in these things, and so we have to have the bridges attached to. <coughs> and for at least planar n equals four, this is the correct answer. The, the L loop amplitude is given directly in terms of on-shell diagrams in this way. And you might be wondering, what is, how is this capturing loop integrals? Well, what you find is that when you feed into this recursion L loops, uh, you know, at L loops, you'll find that you only generate graphs on the right-hand side that have four L extra degrees of freedom. And the Feynman, the face, the integration contour is very easy to specify. The off-shell Feynman momentum, the D4L that we'd like to do, that contour, is just the phase space integral of the on-shell line, of this, of this internal line, plus one extra D alpha. So it's basically, it, it reproduces the, the four degrees in the Feynman loop integral, the virtual things, as purely on-shell um, integrations. Um, but notice that the constraint, the contour of integration is basically over our all real L, which becomes a quadratic constraint in these variables. So the integration measure is very simple. It's just a bunch of D alphas, basically. But the, um, but the contour of integration is some complicated uh, second degree surface. So this must be related to the Feynman integrals. Yeah, this is so if you nothing but the Feynman integrals on shell. Exactly. Yeah. And this works. Um, I mean, the day that these things were first discovered, we, we were able to reproduce more than, I mean, uh, the, this, this is an amazingly efficient tool. Now, I wish I had more time to talk about the loop integrals and all the problems that we have. The open questions about how to do these integrals, which, I, which would basically have to be another two talks or something. <coughs> um, so let's just, but I want to focus, I really just want to use the recursion relations as, an, as a C for examples to look at concrete examples. Sorry, but I mean, yeah. I'm almost a figure like this, but technically this L is the shift that you do in the Feynman integrals just to be able to simplify the integration over the, the loop. Yeah. That's what you do, because then you have a, basically a fake integral, and you have, mm -hmm. to, you have left with the Feynman integrals in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the shift does, or am I wrong? Um, it's a, uh, I mean, you introduce some fake integrals, right? Yeah. That's what you do with the Feynman integrals. Yeah. So I would assume this is just relatively similar kind of thing. Um, well, it, it, it's... I teach in quantum field theory, and some you do loops, you actually make sure that you do actually the Feynman parameterization because you reduce basically the product of integrals, the product of the denominator to, to a single square. Yes. But it's not just a similar thing. Well, it, it, it definitely simplifies the integrand in, the similar, in a similar kind of way. In fact, it simplifies it maybe even more, because instead of being you know, some horrible denominator with lots of quadratic things, it starts off actually, I don't have time to explain this, but it basically just becomes d, d alpha over alphas. So it's just purely d log, d log, d log. So it's even nicer. Um, but the, the uh, uh, for the four particle amplitude, it's identical, so it works, yeah. Uh, but more generally, the uh, it's, uh, it has, uh, the, the kinds of diagrams you get here get generate integrands that have uh, propagators that are shifted by some complex momentum, usually. So it actually makes it somewhat hard to, to find the... Uh, but I mean, when you do the Feynman integrals, you don't care if it's obviously a complex. Yeah, but you, but you do care about which poles are enclosed when you wick rotate. Sure. And that actually... And, and we don't yet have a nice systematic way of doing that. In that, that case, you have so. to be careful because you have to pull your propagators and not even your shape. Yes. So here, if you just... Uh, if I just... I restrict myself to on shell propagators. I don't really care about where I mean, I will care, but I already know where they are. If I go to and if you're, you're, not, you're not taking those of general uh, loops, you're actually restricted to the subclass of loops where you already know they're on shell. Sure. No, no, no. In the case, in the case of, of, I mean, of parameterization, I'm more ambitious. I'm actually really trying to do the loop, right? Yeah. The like, yeah, infinite is more in complicated, but if I were to put delta functions, I would probably actually simplify my life. It doesn't oh, mean absolutely. that it's yeah. Like, yeah. So I'm just trying to understand what is actually a completely new mm -hmm. element or just a, 
geometric uh, representation to the spinner uh, die, and the spinners and of the same things that I used to do for theory. I thought that was actually the same thing. I supplied this paper, I read this paper mm -hmm. with the. Uh, well, so, I mean, one one new thing here is that I'm not expanding a basis of integrals or anything like this. I'm just generating. Well, I understand. Yeah, that's but I mean, but, but that's new. But, 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 but you, on the other hand, you're restricting to the to a subset of diagrams which are technically unshared. Yes. So yeah. That actually, I would say, it is so, a big simplification. So, so uh, be, being in a uh, uh, a continuous uh, an extreme optimist, I, I'm I'd be, I I'm willing to say that that. Uh, that your statement that all you need to do is just be careful about the contours is exactly is is completely correct and, and done. The problem is that nobody's yet taken the time to be careful enough to do this. No, and yeah. stuff. So and there's still some open questions. The job. I'm only trying to understand whether there is a breakthrough in terms of what the new field theory or exactly what they always did in field theory with spinners. And that can still be a breakthrough, but it's just a geometric interpretation, so yeah. we'll be able to be done. Well, one aspect that's uh, maybe, well, there are many ways in which things can be seen, and they all can be equally interesting, but it's nice yes, to yes. see whether it's a true, completely new technique, or it's just the same, only nicely packed. Well, if this story is correct, it's definitely going to reproduce exactly the old story. It has to, and that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just first, uh, let me, let's restrict the attention to just the tree-level diagrams, just to give some intuition here. Um, and as also as a way to motivate the sim remarkable simplicity that we find in equals four. So the first thing that's just completely incredible about these recursion relations is that they immediately capture the simplicity that Park Taylor amplitude. So let me show you how that works. So say the four particle amplitude. You have to glue in these two things, and you can have uh, if you want k equals two on the outside, you need to have uh, white blue, and you can glue them two different ways. Now it turns out that this that a white vertex on the left imposes a constraint on, these, on this external momentum. It says that the lambda of particle one and two are proportional to each other. So for generic kinema external kinematics, this diagram always vanishes, which means that there's always exactly one diagram that contributes to any k equals two amplitude. So any amplitude of k, total k equals two is just a single term. It's a lower amplitude bridged on this, uh, the, the, uh, with the three particle on, on the uh, right hand side. So let me show you, so, so for four particles, it's just one picture. That's not such a big improvement over Feynman diagrams, which would be three. But it gets, becomes more incredible. And of course, we could have chosen any pair of legs to do the recursion, so we could have, you know, those two pictures are the same. So for five particles, this would be 25 Feynman diagrams. Well here, we get one term in the recursion. It's just the four particle on the left with the white vertex on the right. And then we feed, the, we do the recursion on this thing, and we get that little picture like that. Now it's a scary looking picture, but it's one term, not 25 Feynman diagrams. For six particles, again, we have one picture. We just did the five particle amplitude, and we recurse that, and we recurse that, and we get a picture like that. Now again, these pictures look a little scary, but I'm, I really want to emphasize that this has nothing to do with, it's not a three loop anything, it's just a rational function, and it's the park taylor amplitude. So, so, so this immediately, we've now proven the park taylor amplitude for all multiplicities. Now, it also generates very concise formulas for all, all, all other amplitudes. This, this is a, Still, um, the by far the most concise way to represent any scattering amplitude um, uh, in most well, in any theory involving with any gauge symmetries. Um, uh, the recursion relations happen to be just as bad as the Feynman expansion for by four theory, but otherwise it's so it's it's better than or equal to the Feynman expansion. So for the six particles with k equals three, there are three terms. We can recurse them, say this way, and we get this nice three-term formula for this for this uh, the amplitude that doesn't have all the outgoing gluons the same helicity. Now, I want to make some just general points about this about these recursion relations. First, there is it does not give you a unique answer for the form, for the amplitude, and the reason is because at every stage of the recursion, you're allowed to choose any pair of legs you want as the special legs to to put the bridge across. And that means that instead of writing these three terms, I could have, for example, written these three terms. And as rational functions, none of these three rational functions are equal to any of these three rational functions. So you have these two totally different looking <coughs> representations. And two different representations might not be that impressive, but say when you have eight particles, when you have four particles to go to four particles, um, that amplitude is a 20 term expression, and there are 104 linearly independent collections of 20 terms that are all equal to each other. Um, so you can write it many, many, many different ways. So there's lots and lots of different ways. There isn't, 
It's very much very different from the Feynman expansion where you sum over all diagrams. No, you don't sum over all diagrams. You recurse the diagrams and you get a specific list. But that specific list is not depends on how you got how, which legs you chose at every stage. Um, the fact that the amplitude can be expressed in so many different ways as the positive sum of different functions was the moral uh, fuzzy motivation for thinking about the amplitude as perhaps computing some volume and, and the recursion relations is just chopping it up into little pieces that are canonical. For example, there's no one-term formula for the area of a pentagon, but there are lots of three-term formulas for the area of a pentagon, because, and all of them amount to triangulating it in some way. Okay, there's also a four-term formula for the area of a pentagon. You can put a point in the middle and write it, or a five-term formula. And there, are, you could chop it up into millions of little triangles if you wanted, and that would be closer in spirit to the Feynman expansion. And this is the, what was made concrete by the amplitudehedron, which I won't really have time to talk about for the rest of this talk. Um, much more interestingly for, this, for our present discussion is the fact that there are kind of trivial identities here. And this was, these were noticed immediately in the, as soon as these recursion relations were first discovered in 2004. And they were discovered in terms of these pictures, which is that there are, there are trivial relations among them. See, this, although they look very different as diagrams, this is a rational function is almost more, it's basically the exact same rational function as this one, just with all of the indices rotated by two. Now, of course, the diagrams are not rotations of each other, but this is a rational function is the same as that rational function, is the same as that rational function. And so really, this, is, this three term formula is just basically one term plus its rotation plus its rotation. Um, and that kind of extra simplicity is not captured by these pictures at all which is probably why these kinds of pictures stopped being drawn in the physics literature. It's too bad, because around the exact same time they started being drawn, these exact pictures started being drawn in the math literature, <coughs> and it would have saved us a ton of time if we knew that that was happening um, um, uh, earlier than we did. So, but it's natural to wonder from the physics point of view is what is the invariant way of categorizing the physical, you know, what are these functions when you draw pictures like this? How do you characterize them and how do you compute them a little more systematically than what I've shown you so far? Well, there are basically two, two operations you can do on a diagram that leave the function on the outside unchanged. The first is fairly trivial, which is that if you have a, a chain of same colored vertices, this just imposes the constraint that all these lambda tildes are proportional to each other, which means that I can merge and unmerge it any way I'd like. And so trees of single colors, vertices, can be reconfigured any way you'd like, and it leaves the function on the outside unchanged. Um, if you would like to, that means that you could define a bivalent vert, uh, graph where the, you only have white and blue connecting to each other by just clustering all the little trees of same colored vertices together. But I won't do that in, much in this talk. The less trivial move that you can do is anywhere inside the graph, if you see a little four-particle box like this, because this is the four-particle tree amplitude, it's cyclically invariant, and that means that we can redraw it. And if you just combine these two moves, you can relate graphs that look very different from each other. You can relate them by these sequences of moves. Now, it was noticed by, um, by Thurston, who actually went the other way, logically, but that, that these moves leave invariant a very simple combinatorial description uh, characteristic of the graph. So for any two-colored graph whatsoever, you can associate with it a permutation. So the, uh, the idea is the following. You start with a graph, on the, and you label the legs on the outside, a plenty planar graph. And you start at leg A, and you follow it inward. And every time you see a white vertex, you turn left. And every time you see a blue vertex, you turn right. Okay, and it's very easy to see that these moves leave that permutation invariant. And so function modulo these things can be labeled invariantly by these permutations. Um, and so, perhaps, we can hope that we can just get rid of the graphs altogether and just talk about these permutations. And that happens to work for planar n equals 4. So, let me show you a oh, concrete example of this. So, I remember I claimed that this picture and this <coughs> picture as functions were the same if you just change the indices by 2. Okay? So, I claimed that these two functions are the same, and all we need to do is just compare their permutations. So, we start with this, we see 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 5, 3 goes to 6, 4 goes to 1, 5 goes to 2, et cetera. Because they have the same permutation, they are the same function. I should point out that, the, that, the, that two graphs which have the same permutation don't necessarily, the converse isn't always true, but it's always true for, these, for, uh, for the graphs I'm going to draw in this talk. So there's a, so there's a small exception to, this, to the converse. But it's, the converse is definitely valid in this case. So all we need to do is check their permutations. And it's true for all the diagrams generated by the recursion relations. Okay, 
Now, just for conventions, it's, it's easier to lay, just uh, in hindsight, there's uh, some technical advantage to declaring as a convention that the image of every leg is greater than or equal to itself. So instead of saying that 4 goes to 1, I'm just going to say that 4 goes to 7, which is, of course, 1 mod 6. Or, you know, six 1 is, of course, you know, 7 mod 1, or 6. Sorry. Anyway, um, so we just add n to anything that, that would have gone to something less than itself. Okay, so we can invariantly label this graph by just this, and if you just knew this function, this uniquely characterizes the function of the Okay. So let's see how this little observation becomes a really useful tool, to a very, very powerful way to represent these functions and to basically get rid of every, get rid of all the graphs altogether. So, um, oh, there's one more little, well, maybe, maybe I'll skip over this for the sake of time. But there's, there's a, clearly an infinite number of graphs, but only a finite number of permutation, and the mismatch is explained by the fact that if you, there's a notion of reducibility, and if you have a graph like, like this, it's almost the same function as the graph without the bubble. And the reason is because this is just a BCFW bridge on this graph. So this is just a D alpha over alpha, an overall prefactor of D alpha over alpha times this, of this graph. And it doesn't shift any of the external momenta. So this, um, so this, so graphs related by bubbles are almost the same up to a trivial prefactor. So then there's, the statement is that there's a finite number of, ir of reduced graphs, and there's up, and then you can add on to them as an infinite number of bubbles if you want. Okay. So, the way to see, to, the way to, um, to make, turn this into a very powerful tool is to notice that a BCF, adding a BCFW bridge acts really nicely on the permutations. All it does is transpose the images. And this becomes powerful when you start, re when you read it in the other direction. So, if I knew that there was a function a, a non-shell diagram that was labeled by this permutation, it would be related to a simpler diagram uh, with a D alpha over alpha in front of it, related by the, the transposed permutation. And by decomposing a permutation into a sequence of adjacent transpositions in this way, we can basically peel off a bunch of bridges until we get to something that's fairly trivial. And just to make that concrete, let's just look at one example. So this is the permutation labeling that diagram we had a moment ago. And any way of decomposing it into adjacent transpositions gives you a representative graph and a representative function. You know, it, it gives you a representation of the function. Um, but just to be concrete, let's choose to always peel off the first transposition where the images are ordered. So, for, so in this case, so, I, so let's say I emailed you this permutation. What graph are we talking about? What function are we talking about? Well, you don't know what the graph looks like, but whatever it is, one comes in somewhere and comes back out at three. Two goes in somewhere and comes back out at five. Okay, and um, we know that this function, whatever it is, has to be a, a BCFW bridge on legs one two on some simpler graph. And we can now look at the next one, which is uh, two and three, and peel off that bridge. And we can keep doing this until we get to the identity permutation. So we can just sequentially peel off bridges until we have uh, the function we care about in terms of a sequence of, above, of eight bridges on something that should be trivial. Now what is this something trivial? Well, this is the diagram labeled by the identity. That's, which is the same as this diagram without all the bridges. So just remove all the bridges. It's easy to see what this, this diagram is. a weird looking diagram, I'm sure, but um, it imposes the constraint that all the internal lambda are vanishing. And whether it's blue or white, um, tells you whether it's uh, the lambda that has to vanish or the lambda tilde that has to vanish. Which we can write this way. Um, and naturally, of course, we can introduce an auxiliary 3 by 6 matrix to encode that. Um, and so, which you won't be surprised by, um, introducing a thing like this. And now we just add bridges. Now, instead of actively shifting the lambdas, we can tra trade the shift of the lambdas and lambda tildes as a transformation of the, of the matrix in a very simple way. So adding a bridge between legs 4 and 6 shifts column six by something proportional to column four. Okay. And similarly. So we keep we can and the number of delta functions never changes and we just get this nice representative. So we now have just constructed an uh, an eight dimensional submanifold inside the space of three by six matrices. Um, we've got this eight auxiliary <coughs> plus volume degrees of freedom. We have this very simple volume form, which is just a wedge product of a bunch of D logs. Okay? And what is what is what are these alpha's doing there because they're totally internal and auxiliary. <coughs> well, notice the number of delta functions never changed. They were always two times the number of particles. There's two delta functions per particle. 
So there's 12 delta functions total, four of which encode momentum conservation. So there are eight excess delta functions, eight internal degrees of freedom. You can eliminate them all. So, doing, so eliminating the alphas converts them into functions of lambdas and lambda tildes and gives us the function that we care about. And so now, this provides us directly with a Grossmannian representative of the graph with this very simple, nice volume form um, that didn't come from gluing together vertices in any way. In fact, now we, now we can translate the recursion relations for planar n equals 4 purely in terms of these permutations as operations on permutations. And we can just use this technology, the story, to generate a function for every permutation. Great. And this is a very general statement. A very general statement. And I want to emphasize one of the uh, important consequences of the simplicity, simplicity of this general form, at least in the case of planar n equals 4. And in the next slide, this is basically the last slide. Um, in, in the summary, I want to sh I'll show you explicitly how this changes for different theories. Because it's closely related to a very optimistic uh, conjecture or um, suggestion. This, this story suggests something very powerful that I think uh, that always usually gets me in trouble because I'm too optimistic, but whatever, hold on. So for, notice immediately that if I can write any on-shell diagram this way, that this identification is, tr is trivially left invariant by any diffeomorphism of the coordinates, the alphas, any diffeomorphism of the alphas that leaves the volume form invariant. So a volume-preserving diffeomorphism clearly doesn't change to the left-hand side in any way. This becomes an untrivial statement when you realize that because of the delta functions, a diffeomorphism in the alphas can be reinterpreted as an active transformation of the lambdas and lambda tildes, which means that the function is now left invariant by, by, a diffeomor by an infinite dimensional uh, symmetry among the lambdas and lambda tildes. So there's an infinite family of lambdas and lambda tildes that have exactly the same function. And in the case of planar n equals 4, you ask what, are, what is the class of diffeomorphisms that leaves these measures invariant? What does that correspond to as a symmetry in the external data? We have a name for this, and it's called the Yangian. And it was a huge discovery in 2006 that, that in scattering amplitudes in n equals 4 had an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra attached to them. Um, it was a huge discovery because people thought that they defined the theory to be the nicest one possible with the most symmetry. And by the most symmetry I mean, had superconformal invariance. And it wasn't until 2006, from, as a property of these diagrams, that people discovered that, that there's actually an infinite dimensional symmetry beyond superconformal invariance that the amplitudes are invariant under. I'm sorry, just, uh, yeah. This is basically a reparameterization scene. It's a reparameterization symmetry in, si in, si in the alphas. Right, that you introduce to simplify the connecting different for certain diagrams, because this again is a subclass of diagrams. Yeah, this is just a diagram by diagram statement at the moment. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I'm not sure this is a symmetry of, of the entire theory, because right now you're just considering a subset of diagrams for which you introduce a reparameterization. I mean, that is, that is a mathematician, so I don't consider that the th a symmetry of the theory yet. That is a very good point. So, so the, uh, the, the way to make so, so there's kind of a short circuit that's available for n equals 4 that's not available for more general theories yet, um, which is that there's kind of a, there's a maximal diagram of which all other diagrams in the theory have to be subsets of, which is just the it's the the it's the top cell in the Grassmannian. All the other cells have to be subsets of it. And so you have, if you ask the question, what's the, what are the diffeomorphisms that preserve that one? You immediately answer the question for what are the symmetries, it immediately preserves all possible diagrams. And because of the recursion relations, we know the amplitude can be expressed in terms of So we immediately see it's a symmetry of the full theory. For um, uh, non-planar n equals 4, or any a more general theory, all I've shown so far is that the diagram has an infinite dimensional symmetry. That's not as meaningful, of course, as you point out. If I think a specific diagram, I yeah. can find symmetries with another. Yeah, so, so my, I, my source of optimism is that if I've got infinite dimensional symmetries in every single term, it would have to be a horrible and evil conspiracy for them to all cancel each other out and have nothing overlapping. Let me but, see if I can prove this in one line. If you take this function, right, this is a prefactor of the whole of the entire scattering amplitude. There will be function in front of it which you have not determined yet. You mean of the coupling constants? Right. Sure, oh, yeah. And the coupling constants also depends on the moment. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, so now 9 equals 4. Yes. I mean, that's yes. why it's the same. That no, that's the same. I don't give it that because it's a, a superperformal theory with a fixed point that, and it's a semi classical in nature, so the counts don't even run. That's, this, this is all, this, so, these are all you know, very good points. Yeah. So if I have a, just take young let's forget about the uh, two variables, then it's a prefactor. The prefactor depends on the energy in the moment. Yeah, yeah. I just simply can't see how, and those will be metric dependent, not volume terms. I'm I'm still optimistic that oh, there's I, a. I believe that there is an interesting stuff, but I, I, I as I said, in, this, in one line I can just say that the prefactor of it won't be a constant; it will depend on the energy which you do it. It's but it's still uh, that's it's not a no-go theorem because it's still possible that there's some symmetry that preserves that as well. Some, but you're right, you're right. <laughs> but if I'm a theoretical, if I'm a mathematician, I would consider I would consider that far away from any kind of strong statement. Oh sure, sure. Um, yeah. In any particular form, I mean, in supersymmetry, many things collapse, right? They can many, that can many exactly be the functions because in other cases, can't even do that. But it's, it's well, okay. Yeah. So whether or not the symmetry is meaningful in more general theory is an open question. Um, yeah. It's still interesting that you find symmetry for the kinem pure kinematics. Yeah. I mean, if I'm in two dimension, I have a Young-Bach set equations, right? I mean, this, the theory says that is all the Yeah. So, so, do you have any intuition last year in this rule, or do you just believe that it's I do have some, a little bit of intuition. Um, so first, having an infinite dimensional symmetry doesn't mean that the theory is solvable. It doesn't even really help you. Because every two-dimensional conformal field theory has an infinite dimensional symmetry. Um, and not all of them are integrable. So, so it doesn't actually mean that this is a useful thing. I mean, in n equals 4, it's useful to see integrability, but it's not actually useful for finiteness. It's not useful for any of the other. I mean, uh, it's, just, it's debatable whether or not the Yangian is a powerful thing to, to use. But um, but there, so my my one intuition that there might be a story that survives in a general theory is from Strominger and more recently Strominger and Cachazo, where they show that the if you think about the S matrix literally at asymptotic infinity as a function which takes in states and out states at scry plus and scry minus um, in flat space, then uh, they show is that the that the uh, BMS group is an infinite dimension basically becomes. A, uh, makes it a conformal field theory at asymptotic infinity. Um, now there's a ton of qualifications for that statement, and so it's not at all clear that that's a really compelling argument, but it gives me, uh, it, it makes it not absurd that, uh, that there could, that it could, that it, that it's still, it could be true, it's plausible at least, that all quantum field theories have an infinite number of symmetries. Uh, an example of an infinite number of symmetries is QCD at infinite work masses, we have basic position minus we have an infinite yeah, yeah. number of super selected uh, yeah. uh, states, but that doesn't mean that you solve the theory. No, of course, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, and that's also kinematics, in Galilean type of. Absolutely. Okay, so let me, let me summarize the story here, what the, what the connection is. So in, for a general quantum field theory, we have this notion of on-shell diagrams, which we, are, which we can define. And the, for theories of massless particles, at least, those, the, the, these diagrams are unnormalized. They're just meaningful functions that we can talk about. And there's always this way of representing them in terms of this Rasmanian <laughs> very amount of supersymmetry. So there's this very generic connection between on, uh, physically interesting functions, these on-shell diagrams, and some subspace C parameterized by some internal degrees of freedom um, with an associated volume form. So there's some submanifold inside the Grassmannian with some particular volume form that comes from gluing together all the vertices in that theory. Um, and we have another correlation, which is that volume-preserving diffeomorphisms of, on the right-hand side correspond to physical symmetries. And some of these are completely trivial. So some of them are trivial identities. They don't change, they don't even move the external momentum. Um, at all, and those correspond to cluster mutations, and I think this is a very general statement and an important one, because the study, there's been a really rich mathematics literature in recent years about cluster varieties, which are basically the right-hand side modulo cluster mutations, which means it's left, those are gonna be related to left-hand side modulo trivials, trivialities. So let's look at some examples. In planar n equals four, the on-shell diagrams look like this. Of course, they're, two, they're graphs with two colors, they're planar, and they have no directed edges. So it's just straight lines, very simple. Okay? And the space of submanifolds that these things are associated with is a very special space. It's called, uh, called the positroid variety. And the study of positroid varieties has led to an enormous, rich set of mathematics literature in the last you know, six or seven years or so. It's been a very, very rich area of study. And the reason is because it's entirely combinatorial. 
And the, the volume forms that it's associated with is just in a, in a maximally simple form. It's just d alpha over alpha in this kind of simple parameterization, which we can get from the, from the bridge decomposition of the graph. Now, and the reason why it's so interesting on both sides is because, and why it's so simple on both sides, is because both the diagrams and the geometry, which I didn't have time to talk about, are naturally described by, by a permutation. And so you can label, invariantly label a positroid submanifold by a permutation, and you can invariantly label the physical function by this permutation as well. Um, and the physical symmetries of the volume preserving diffeomorphisms in this case are certainly what we call the yang yang. So it makes this very simple. But the story is general. So what is it, what's true for n less than 4? In n less than 4, we have diagrams like this that have arrows everywhere. That's much more data. It's a much more complicated object. It's not just a permutation. But we can compute it in terms of the same kind of Grassmannian. And in fact, the variety is always the same. The only thing that differs between n equals 4 and n equals 0, pure diagonals, is some prefactor raised to some particular power, which depends on the alphas in general. Notice in this case, it's 1 to the n minus 4. That means that this picture, this, func this on-shell function in pure Yang mills is identical to the, to the function that we get in, in maximally supersymmetric Yang mills. This is actually, a, the, there's a way to turn this whole statement on its head, which is just, and it turns out that you can actually compute all on-shell functions in maximally supersymmetric theories in terms of diagrams involving only gluons. So you actually never need the rest of the supermultiplets anywhere. You can always equate this particular n equals 4 thing as a particular n equals 0 thing, if you want. So the n equals 4 is really trivial. Okay. Um, let's do, when non-planar n equals 4, we have diagrams like this, example, that, the example that I gave you before. We, have some, we again can associate it with some matrix, but it's no longer a positroid variety. It's no longer labeled by a simple permutation. What is it labeled by? That's an open question in mathematics. Very interesting and active open question in mathematics. But the volume form is the same, okay? So it's still this, just the alpha over alpha. And you just get some sub-variety like this. And we don't have a name for these physical symmetries. We don't know if it's, uh, it's not, we certainly don't have a name for it. We don't know if it survives when you, all the, when you add up all the diagrams together. For a non-planar n equals zero. When you say physical symmetries, right? It has got an effect on the physical state. So far, so, so far. This uh, is a reparameterization. Reparameterizations are not physical, unless you actually tell us. Oh, no, no, this is an active changing of the momenta of the external states. Right, right, but I mean, so what does that in, in practice mean I mean, in terms of uh, the amplitude? When you mean physical, there's a spectrum, you can you, you determine the spectrum of the and that will give you, you know, it's, it's going to be able to label what? Is that? Well, we're, 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 we're talking about the symmetries. Right, I'm trying to understand, is this physical, on which part of the theory is going to be well, physical? And so so what, what, when I say is a physical symmetry, so, to this side, right? so, so for me, so, so let me define terms. So uh, for me, uh, a symmetry of the, of the S matrix is, is uh, so the S matrix is some function of all the external states. If you can transform actively the external kinematics in some way, mm -hmm. all the momenta and the helicities in some way, and the function is left unchanged, that's what I'm calling a symmetry. As a physical thing, do you actually, let me just, I'm just trying to understand. I'm not yeah. Trying to be blind, I'm just trying to Does it mean that two different scattering configurations have the same result? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, in a general theory that's non planar and has no supersymmetry, you get these weird prefactors, but again, volume preserving diffeomorphism must correspond to something. There's a question of whether or not there are any volume performing preserving diffeomorphisms. It seems obvious that there are always some, and there's a question, an open and important question, of whether or not the combination of, of such symmetries, you know, although you have symmetries for each diagram, whether or not the combination of diagrams needed to write the amplitude actually has any symmetry, you know, if they have any overlap between them. That's an open question. Okay, so let me summarize, you know, just wrap things up with just some opening open questions that are still very interesting. So on, for both purely mathematical reasons, because of this connection to the Grassmannian, and for physical reasons, there's a, a great motivate pressure to just simply understand the scope of these functions. So for non-planar n equals 4, for supergravity, for non-supersymmetric theories, just pure QCD, etc., the class of functions that we have is this class of on-shell functions. And 
they're not they're labeled by more than permutations, but there aren't that many of them. I mean, they satisfy many identities, and we don't yet have a, um, a mathematical backs uh, foundations to classify all of these things. We don't, we don't know if they're classified by permutations. We don't know what they're classified by. But there's clearly um, uh, redundant data in these pictures. So, so it's very interesting just to study the scope of them. Uh, verifying the, the, uh, the, there's a natural proposal for the all loop recursion relations in any quantum field theory. Uh, basically, it's basically the exact same picture I drew for you. And there's an open question of whether or not they're correct, whether they're complete and correct for a general theory. I don't know. There's a lot of problems involving ample, uh, doing the loop integrals um, in terms of these variables that uh, is a very active and interesting open question in research. And we don't yet, and this, there's way too much there to, be, to really talk about this uh, comprehensively. And uh, then there's this important interesting in question, which is whether or not there's a non-recursive definition of what the S matrix is. Um, in the case of planar n equals 4, it turns out there, the answer is yes, and it's a, a very beautiful story. You can just, uh, all the recursion relation is, this picture that you can chop up, that, you're, that all the recursion relation is doing are, is chopping up the volume into little canonical pieces is made very explicit in the story of the amplitude heatrain. And there's a, it's a very rich and interesting question whether or not there's a similar geometric backbone behind more general quantum field theories. Okay, so I'll just close with a pretty picture and... Uh, and uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> so if I apply this to gravity, uh, which kind of, how do I see the difference when I change my action? For example, if I take standard answer in perfection, I have uh, that the on shell, condition is p squared equal to zero. But for example, if I take a combination of an R squared term, a Val tensor, and something, how do I do a computation in this equation? Well, um, um, well so, so I think there are two, two aspects of every question, if I understand correctly. The, um, um, and one of, them is, one of them is about, are you asking about gauge choices at all, or not? Um, no, no, I'm just asking how do, so you're, ex, you're calculating amplitude. I just want to understand yeah. exactly in which field you are calculating that amplitude. Yes, so it, For example, if you speak about gravity. So when we talk about gravity, um, uh, gravity is a theory with a spin two particle. Um, and the th all the three particle S matrices involving a two plus, uh, H equals two plus or minus two amplitude are just uniquely fixed. There's some coefficient, which could be scale dependent. Um, so and those will change. For example, if I do gravity with the white tensor square interaction, or if I do gravity with the R, with the Ricci scalar. So I'm not exactly sure how. So so I don't know exactly the translation between these uh, de descriptions of the theories in terms of Lagrangians versus you know like if you added R, you know higher uh, some effective theory with more operators. For example, just yeah. to say if I take just white square, I'm just fantasizing the gravity. Yeah. But if I take an R term and an R square, I have both a graviton and a conformal mode. So sure. I would have two particles somehow. Sure. Where do I see this? I saw the dynamics, so basically what I'm saying, I'm changing the dynamics, giving yeah. the cinematics equal. What, that, what, what changes is the coefficients. Oh, but I mean, I can explain that. I mean, so, 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 the, so the question is, if I can leap between the two. Well, it was describing it as just a kinematic. So you never compute any of those blocks. You compute just the kinematics. And it was gloomy kinematic. Yeah. And the incertain tiers, the blobs, are relatively simple. So that yes. I can perform up the tier that constants, you can just basically put them together as I see. In your case, you're asking, what if I have as external states? I don't know what your theory of gravity is, but in external states you have spin two objects. Mm -hmm. Might have spin, spin two and it's an and, and escape of it. And that's what you're telling me is the, the, from his point of view, we would just say, okay, spin two object in the external state on shell is an object which has to be represented by the product of a number of spinners. That will all use as basically the geometry of my space, and it will actually glue them together. So I would write instead, or rather, rather than in PMU for the external states, I would write that in terms of the spinners and the density, which in this case has two square masses particle. If on the top you have a vertex which has also scale, okay, I will have an object which has also the uh, this is zero for that state and I glue them together. 
That is a, that, the question is whether or not that, that, that's the question that the conformal mode is physical or not. So he's only going to discuss the physical states in the final in the final time. Yeah, so if you can't see the aspect discuss uh, yeah. now different dynamical actions will give different prefactors to this kinematical factor. Right? That's why I was being bidding yeah. on him very much at the beginning because he made yeah. some very nice and then he saw the theory. But the truth is that there is a, a dynamic in front of it which depends theory by theory. I mean, you cannot, uh, you cannot. Another example, I have QCD and I look at three gluons with the final state or I have just pure annuals, I see we see three gluons in the final state but the coefficient in front is different. No, no, no. actually I, I want to clarify this a little bit. The, um, the coefficient can't depend in any way on the, for the three particle amplitude because the coefficient, uh, it can't be a function of the, uh, the coefficient of the three particle amplitude cannot depend in any way on the kinematics. It's not log, it's not running, or anything like this. It just has to be some number because it, because we fixed all the kinematics. Yeah, what I'm saying is that for the genetic amplitude. For the amplitude, there is lots of kinematic amplitude. Yeah. So from that point of view, once, it, once you use the standard spinners for final state, you don't, you don't worry about quantizing gravity, you just worry the kinematics of the gravity. So that's fine. But you know, all the problem of the concentration yeah. of the yeah. front of it, that will be in the function of the yeah. Sure, sure. And then, you know, it's where you, you can accommodate both. Sure. There's nothing wrong in having yeah. kinematics fixed. Yeah. So is it clear? Is it clear now? Yes, no, I was, because... You can quite like recognize the external states for shell particles because it's a physical stuff. It doesn't care about the way you did it. But you won't be able to predict the amplitude. Okay. Just another question. Mm -hmm. um, I would like, for example, to use this technique for doing a calculation in effective theory. Yep. So, the first question is, there is a result by Dunbar and Norridge about uh, scattering of gravitons. First of all, how is this, how is that technique related to yours? Is your technique an evolution of that one that they use? This is calculation from the 90s. And they also used uh, notations like your like square brackets, one, two, and things like that. They usually call it KLT. <coughs> so I mean, well, there, there, there are there few, uh, there are few, few uh, branches to that question. Um, so I mean, the KLT relations are are kind of trivial in this case, just because it, it happens to be the case that the pure gravity. If you replace h equals plus or minus one with h equals plus or minus two. The gravity three particle amplitudes are exactly the square of the Yang Mills amplitudes. So there's a diagram at a diagrammatic level, there's a every vertex exactly squares. So it's just a very kind of a how that translates into the amplitude is a complicated story, and it's always been a complicated story. So it's but but there's another aspect of your question, which is effective field theory. And let me let me explain, I guess, what I think the statement is for a general quantum field theory. So here, instead of writing down a Lagrangian, if you want to talk about, you want to define the theory that you care about, you list the fun, you list the fundamental particles and what the and what the the non-vanishing three-particle interactions are. Maybe none of them. Maybe there are no three-particle interactions. But you write down your list of elementary S matrices. Now the recursion relations start gluing these things together in some complicated way, and you start generating these recursions. But the recursion stops when you reach an irreducible amplitude. And so if you have a, an irreducible effective six particle vertex in some theory, then you would have to start feeding that into the recursion. For phi four theory, um, you have an irreducible four particle vertex and you need to include that as well in the recursion relations. And when you include recurs recursions that involve the three particle vertex and the four particle vertex, the recursion relations generate exactly the same number of terms as the Feynman expansion. So it's not any improvement over the over traditional story. But again, so instead of stating that you have phi four theory by writing Lagrangian, you can just say, I have an irreducible three particle vertex involving just scalar fields and an irreducible four particle vertex involving scalar fields. For example, if I have phi to the sixth, I would have an irreducible. Six particle vertex. Okay. And I think you that's just feed it into the same machinery as before. Okay, so that's how you distinguish different dynamics. That's yeah. Now, historically, this, I mean, I should, should clarify that I'm taking a very different attitude about a story that's been told differently in, in the past. So it's, there's a very, people are probably familiar with the qualifications about the recursion relations about whether or not it's, the amplitude vanishes sufficiently fast with infinity or something like this. Um, 
And they say, well, the, so that you can read the statement that the BCFW recursion relations work for all quantum field theories that involve that die off sufficiently fast and high uh, momenta or large momenta. That's uh, well, you can take that attitude if you like. From my attitude, you can just include a pole at infinity. There's no problem with this. There's just an irreducible new vertex that doesn't get further recursed. I mean, that's that's the, the, what happens when the theory doesn't die off fast enough at infinity. It just means that there's a term at infinity, which is just some new diagram that has to be included. Um, and uh, and I think that 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 the attitude that you just have these irreducible starting building block vertices encapsulates effective field theories with arbitrary couplings. Well, I mean, well, I assume for certain diagrams it's easier, but it's still probably not for all of them. For example, adding the top. Oh no! I mean, it's. Um, I think it's safe to say that for all. <coughs> So, so there's certainly a point below, below which it's trivial enough to just do the Feynman expansion. But it's safe to say that for all serious, all non-trivial computations that are done at real collider experiments, you know, things like this that involve the top quark, and it, these methods are essentially being used for 100% of them. Or at least some, some sort of non-Feynman, certainly some non, Feynman diagrams are certainly not used. And these methods are used almost everywhere. And the reason is because the degree of efficiency Improvement is absurd. It's just it's, it's, it's incredible. So say so. I think I might have the record for highest order in four-dimensional field theory of seven loops, which uh, is generated by these techniques in terms of a thousand diagrams. A thousand diagrams. That's a lot, but a computer can handle it pretty easily, and that's way better than the ten to the seventy-two Feynman diagrams that would be needed. Um, so I mean, a, yeah, it's a it's a sixty-nine order of magnitude improvement. This probably is on, on shared internal lines. Yep. Okay, so no question, let's think.